Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for tuning in to another episode of LVAD Talk. I have a quite unique episode here today. I am speaking with the world famous international bassist Tom Shad. How are you doing today, sir? I'm very good, Sean. Are we on video too? Because I want to look at the camera and just say hi. Yes, we're on video. Thank you for saying hi. <laughs> we do both. Good. So I appreciate cool. you taking your time out today and speaking with us. Um, one of the reasons I wanted to ask you here is um, you're very relatable. First of all, you're you. a man after my own heart because you're a musician. Second of all, you've yes, also sir. went through a heart transplant. I did. March 2nd, 2020. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yep. So my I had my LVAS surgery on March 2nd. And we lived. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. We we share heart birthdays. <laughs> Happy heart anniversary, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah I, I, I never had the LVAD, so I don't even know. I hear people talk about it. I don't even know. I was in heart failure for a while, but I, I, you, you go ahead. Yeah, it's... it's it, it, and that's one of the reasons I wanted to talk to you today, because mm -hmm. I wanted to prove that we are more than heart failure. That yeah. that doesn't well, take up everything that encompasses who we are, and what we do. No, I mean, there's so much to this, right? Like, I don't know if you have talked about the percentages. I don't have them offhand, but there are a lot of people who are walking around in quote unquote heart failure, right? Mm -hmm. And I don't know if there's a different measurement for you. I know that the one that a lot of us have to deal with is the EF, the ejection fraction. Right, mm -hmm. right? exactly. That's how the heart pumps in, uh, blood in between the atria. The atria or the atria and ventricle? One of those two. Yeah. Um, so there's that. And no, it's not everything, but I, I will say this, that uh, – Life and heart failure, I mean, we're both dads, right? I have, I have a six, almost seven-year-old mm -hmm. uh, in September, and um, I didn't understand because it's it's until, oh, where do we even begin with this? Uh, maybe I just got right into it. So I was born with a heart murmur. Okay. Now, that could mean a lot of things, mm -hmm. right? <clears throat> I think at about 10 or 12, they couldn't detect it anymore, but the instruments weren't as sensitive as they are now. Mm -hmm. Eventually, in my 30s, the, this guy said to me, uh, it was a, the New York Rangers doctor, he just was on the, our insurance plan when I played at Blue Man, said, you have a cardiomyopathy. And I said, okay. And he goes, so just don't lift heavy weights or have rough sex. I'm sorry. I'm mean, going <laughs> is it okay to curse at all? I'm not cursing, but it's just, yeah, we're, we're friendly. We're, <laughs> we're, 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 we're going to get a little family friendly. Okay. <laughs> so, so um, I said, I thought, okay, well, that's cool. You know, I mean, I'm, I haven't lifted weights since I'm 16 and, you know, whatever. <laughs> not interested in the other ones. So, so, uh, what does that even mean? You know, and, um, you know, and it was cool. And then, I had other health issues, um, you know, probably worth mentioning because maybe it'll help somebody too. That I had an eating disorder. I, I've been I'm five ten, and I've been all over the map with weight. Um, I was one hundred forty one pounds for a little bit. Uh, I've been size two ninety three. Um, so, what does that have to do with any of this? Uh, energy that kind of stuff yeah. and like and it's also very defended like for a heavy person it's not fun going to doctors right mm -hmm. because like the lecture and remember this guy is saying to me you know well, you know this is you know this, you might have this and i remember very i'm son my dad was a psychiatrist my brother's a radiologist but i sort of had the arrogance of a medical family mm -hmm. Where the guy's like, you know, you know, this might not be. I'm just. I was like, yeah, but everything's working, right? And so I was playing for Blue Man. I think I was full time at that time. I lived in a five floor walk up. I felt like I was in good shape, which was true sometimes and not others. Um, and uh, at some point, when I moved in with my wife and we were dating, still, I saw this guy in New York, Parique, who said you need a defibrillator, and I thought, no way. Now, I mentioned it to a couple of people because I was 45, something like that, 46, something like that. And they're like, you're too young. You don't need a defibrillator. So I got a second opinion. 
Mm-hmm. And that doctor, Dr. Kim, Betty Kim, who's a lovely human being, uh, she said to me, well, you know, usually we would try drugs first before we go with putting something, you know, because that was sort of like, what does that even mean, defibrillator, right? Something inside your body that can shock you. Mm-hmm. Basically, for people who don't know, if they listen to this podcast or video podcast, they probably know defibrillator, just to say, it prevents you from having a heart attack, what they call an event. Mm-hmm. But it's the event. Right. <laughs> it's the main event, and you need the goalie. Now, I'm very lucky because I have a friend who got his transplant in uh, January. He had ventricular issues. His defibrillator was going off. Uh, no, sorry. It wasn't him. It was another guy that Neil, our friend Neil, was telling us about. His defibrillator was going off the whole time he was being resuscitating. Wow. So I've heard it's like a horse kicking you, and I used to. It I is. Got scared cause it, because I, because I, I, oh, you've had it go off a couple oh, of times, more than more oh, than man. once. Yes, I'm so sorry. I, <laughs> I didn't have it go off once, which I guess there are negatives to it not going off. But but anyway, uh, and I was very scared because I played uh, a Blue Man group, and there's a lot of magnetic things there. And mm-hmm. I've heard the magnetism can, you know, like so it was weird, you know. Um, anyway, so so Betty came. We tried drugs, and then eventually she referred me to this guy Steve Danik, also amazing human being. He's in Boston now, at uh, Mass General, probably one of the best hospitals in the country. I got my transplant at NYP in New York, but uh, both Betty Kim and Steve Danik were extremely great human beings. And Danik, after putting the defibrillator in in October, I think it was October of 2014. So it was a month after my daughter was born. It was very emotional mm-hmm. for me, right? Because I mean, I have a scar up here, mm-hmm. um, you know, uh, and it hurt. You know, it hurt to have that stuff put in, and um, you know, it doesn't feel nice to wear clothes and da da da. Uh, uh, so he put that in, and then eventually he sent me to Dr. Mary Jane Farr, who was at NYP, and um, she said to me, "She's a lovely human being, sort of a superhuman. She runs marathons, as well as being a beautiful doctor. I mean, physically attractive, but also a really good human being." And she's like, "You're going to need a heart transplant before you're 60." I thought, "What?" Right. You know, like I'm a dad, I'm, I'm a musician, I do all this stuff. Blah, 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 blah. And that began about, this is about, this is about, I'm guessing seven years later. Yeah, that, that's about right, right? So, yeah, probably seven, eight, nine years I saw her. And then there are all the, I don't know about you, but there are medications you're on. Some of them mm-hmm. cause gout. That's not fun. Mm-hmm. I also have sleep apnea. So, if you have sleep apnea and you're in heart failure, you need to use your machine. Yes, I just got a new one. <laughs> I just got a new one. And it's about the right mask. Mm-hmm. Because no matter how much they quote unquote fit you, you have to find the fit that works for you. It took me a year of practicing to use it because I was I was prescribed one in the 90s or whatever, early 2000s. And I was just like, I can't do this. I would take loads of melatonin to fall asleep, which I probably it might have killed me, actually. I mean, I just didn't know, right. you know? And, um, you know, like it basically became a doorstop, you know? I threw it out. Like, I was so angry. And there are a lot of people. I mean, the, 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 the compliance rate is very low for people who are prescribed. I mean, I'm part of the apnea group. Also, people don't understand. And I'm sure, well, I don't know. I've asked doctors, I've asked my team again, but it probably exacerbated my condition with my heart. Um, I had a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. It is genetic. Uh, whether my morbid obesity caused, aided and abetted, I don't know. Um, but, you know, like a lot of my, my story was sort of, so first of all, dealing with uh, an, a, an unhealthy relationship with food, through a 12-step program, um, because that's the other thing I just want to mention here that uh, I looked it up, uh, partially based on our discussion, Sean, and I was just like, wow. And I probably, I, I kind of knew it, but I wanted to see, like, the actual numbers. Like, is there, because different teams are different philosophies, but, like, can you be too fat to get a heart transplant? And the answer is yes. Yes. The, the I'm, BMI is I'm 40. Going, yes, I'm going through that now. My BMI is now... I think 31 or 30.5, something like that. So then you're good. Well, they want me to be 30 or less. 
30 or less. Mm-hmm. So your team is more conservative, I mm-hmm. think. Because if you look it up online, I've seen 40, actually. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm, 40. Below, I'm definitely below 40. But they're saying the lower your BMI, the more successful the surgery will be. Well, I mean, there's so much going on, right? Okay. So... So, right. So if I, because like I mentioned before, if I, I mean, I was up there for a while. So basically if I were over, I think about 243, mm-hmm. I wouldn't, I might have been rejected. And, and that's the thing that people, I mean, if they're on this podcast, maybe they already know this, but if they don't know this, you're interviewed. And if they feel like you're not going to be compliant, you may not get a heart transplant. Correct. Hearts are not that plentiful. Yes, you correct. Know? Mm-hmm. You know, and uh, I was blessed with them. Um, a universal uh, recipient status, so that helped me. And also, my doctor was an advocate for me. She, um, I became a status two because it's weird. Like you need to be a status. Says one is too six, pretty much. Status three is not ready, and you know, so it's 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 a game, you mm-hmm. know. I also got just to say, you ask one question, I'm giving you a hundred answers. <laughs> but uh, I got corona in the hospital. Whoa. Not COVID, uh-huh. but Corona. Uh-huh. They were really concerned. Uh, and so that postponed my operation, uh, transplant. And uh, there's a whole bunch of other stuff. But you ask more questions. I have so much to say about this. So how, how did you end up losing the weight? Uh, by eating correctly. Mm-hmm. I know that that sounds really... I I... Because I was also type two diabetic, mm-hmm. I am type two diabetic now. Post transplant, uh, I'm on half the insulin that I was. The steroids do not help. Whenever I get gout, I do get gout here and there. Um, but it was basically about learning um, what plan of eating for me works. I think that the good news and the bad news is that diets work. Mm-hmm. You know, it's it's the head. It's not just the body. Right. But that being or and that being said. Uh, understanding that like sugar and white flour were not really my friend for a while, you know, that helped. Yeah. How did I do it? That next, you know, there's nothing I'm going to say that's not already online, you know, that exercise, uh, uh, not being able to, uh, being able to drink enough water, you know, so that not mistaking thirst for hunger, dealing with my emotional stuff, you know, so that I'm not just eating out of anxiety, boredom, anger, fear. How much how much weight did you lose? Uh well, as of today it would be um eighty eight pounds down for about ten and a half years. Oh, that's great. So yeah, do you great. think your lifestyle as a musician didn't help with that in terms of because oh. I was active as and, a musician and, and traveling and on no. tour and yeah no man no I, well I was not sure I was playing for Blue Man Group uh, well there's no picture I don't have it ready to, to share here but um, maybe I can uh, I could send you maybe I'll send you a picture to, to post if they want to see like I was playing for Blue Man and I was afraid I was going to be fired because I was too fat mm-hmm. believe it or not like I mean I don't know how it's been for you within music and everything. But um, part of it's my head, but part of it is there's a reality. Like, you know, certain people, sometimes it's gender-based, sometimes it's, you know, sexual preference-based, gay or straight is what I mean, or or non-binary in terms of, you know, people's preferences. Sometimes it's certain gigs, people don't want people who are not doing drugs or they can't have anybody who's doing any drugs. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, they want people with long hair, or short hair, or no hair, you know. So, what was my point? Um, I, I think that, yeah, no, it didn't help me. <laughs> I, I, I'd go play the show, and then I'd come home, and, um, you know, I think that at that size, it was harder to, I mean, I drank, I drank a lot also. I loved Belgian beer. Mm-hmm. You know? Not so, I can't have that now. Right, right. You know? Or at least not in the way I used to, for sure. Yeah. So, so it was definitely lifestyle change. I had to change my life, and I was a musician the whole time. Mm-hmm. In fact, what I started doing is I started getting up earlier. Like, because mm-hmm. I basically, in 2009, so I guess what I'm saying is, this is not the heart transplant story, but this is related. So 2009, 
my doctor, April 2009, I saw him because I had a cough. And he said, you have to go to the hospital. And I don't know where my head was at, but I was like, yeah, okay, yeah, no problem. Let's get it back. Because Hoboken, I was living in Hoboken, New Jersey, you know, uh, it's a mile square. So I could just go home and grab my bag and go to the hospital, right? Mm-hmm. No problem. Except for the fact that part of the, why I was, the reason why I was going home was because I had a headboard delivered that day. Okay. And, yeah. And I took a headboard <laughs> up five flights of stairs. What the doctor didn't tell me is that my pulse was 160. I was in a flutter. I could have had a stroke or heart attack. You didn't have your defibrillator then? Oh, no. Ah. I got that in 2014. Yeah, because you definitely would have got a shock doing that. <laughs> maybe, right? If, if Well, right. And then, and then there's that disconnect. I mean, I used to sweat in the winter, you know? So so anyway, um, and I don't hate anybody who's heavy. I just, just want to say that. Like, it's not like there's some people who are thin who are just like, oh, my God, I was the devil. You know, it was like I was doing what I thought was right for me. So so, um, so I did that. And then I ended up being hospitalized. And it was Easter weekend, so they couldn't do anything. I was in ICU. I didn't know about ICU. You can't get out of bed, get out of the bathroom. Right. You can't do anything. Right. No, it sucks. And so, uh, and eventually I was uh, ambulance, and it's and again that is not as cushy as, as in TV and movies. Mm-hmm. Let me tell you, ambulances stink, <laughs> and uh, and you know, it was kind of crazy. And then um, they had to uh, cardiovert me at Hackensack, which is one of the best cardiac places. I was in the hospital for two weeks, mm-hmm. so I was forty four years old, two hundred ninety three pounds. You know. My, you know, I wasn't worried, you know, I didn't have kids then. I wasn't married. I wasn't sure where my relationships were going. You know, I had friends, but I think that like my obesity had kind of pushed people away to some extent. You know, I didn't know it though. Mm -hmm. Um, Anyway, so, uh, so, but I was in the hospital for two weeks. So there were old men coming in and out of the hospital. You know what I mean? And so, but they didn't want me to have, you know, to have a stroke, right? Because you get blood clots after all that stuff. Um, I was cardioverted, and I thought, well, I'm great, you know? But mm-hmm. So that's where it began. I don't know why we started talking about that just now. About being active, yeah. And I think it was, it was sort of the irony, right? It was just like, I was just going hard, and I think that I'd been heart failure. My ejection fracture, I think, was going down over the years. And so the lowest measured one, but as you know, it, or people might know, it's a little bit of an estimate, mm-hmm. do you know? It's sort of like, it's like triangulating something. It's like, well, it looks like it's about 15% or whatever, you know. So I don't know that they can measure it without doing a cath. And even then, I'm not sure if that's a to the millimeter kind of thing. But I think my heart, it was like I was functioning at 15% ejection mm-hmm. fraction, which if you if you understand that 50 is normal, yeah. think about that. So no wonder I was tired walking around. Right. Of course, carrying around 88 pounds extra or whatever really a hundred, you know, that I didn't need. So, so yeah, so there was that. Um, so that was that. Yeah. Yeah. Mine got down to 5%. Ooh. Yeah. And I was going around. I didn't know it. it was, so of one of the things with the LVAD that I found was I didn't realize how sick I was until That's after right. I had the LVAD. And then I'm like, Oh, I'm feeling good. Like I want to do stuff. And well, I can walk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. I'm not tired. Of, I mean, I still get winded, but and steps sure. were the enemy. So, but I started, right. and I was able to start going to work out at the gym and do different things, even though COVID messed that up for me. But I'm in a, I'm in a point where I was so frustrated because I had started working out and had gotten to a routine really good. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. To a point where I was enjoying going to the gym, and if you would have told me a few months before that, I would have thought you was crazy. But right. when they Why told me, that? yeah, right. and it's one of them things that it's like when you can have it. Like this old saying, you don't miss your water until your well runs dry. Mm-hmm. Now all of a sudden, I can't go to the gym. I want to go to the gym. You know what I mean? So yeah, but now I'm at a point now where I kind of got to start over. Well, let me speak to that a little bit. So. And I'm give props to my wife, but at the same time, when we were first dating, because she was kind of like 
there's a gym in our building and so we go to the gym in our building and work out on the treadmill and the whole thing you know and um and she, and i was like yeah well i walk she goes that's not exercise mm-hmm. and i walk miles you know what i mean i mean i'm not an athlete at all and in fact just this morning i can tell you because i do it every day for my heart unless i can't i walk 1.3 miles every morning okay because you know there's a question right do i want to live yes you know, and so today I walked whatever. I walked 1.4 miles. And here's a crazy thing. Just I think it's worth saying on the podcast. This is not to brag. This is talking about my. So as an example, this year's walking and running distance is more than last year's on average. Now it's two miles a day. Last year was 1.6 miles a day. Okay. And and the year before that was probably like another, you know, maybe it was more of like a one mile a day kind of thing, you know. And, and I think that that's the thing that, that a lot of us, yeah, I mean, if you see, you can see the, if you can, we can't really see that, but yeah, it's like, it's, it's kind of crazy to see how, and like, and walking yearly highlights, yeah, I mean, it's, I just wanted to see if there's, a, oh, it only goes back a year, but, but it was kind of crazy, like you say, like I also, because I have sleep apnea, I needed to take naps, you know mm-hmm. what I mean? And so, and then, oh yeah. It just reminded me, talk about steps. So this is, I mean, as gross as this is, I think it's important for people to hear this because I think that what you just said is really, because I did the same thing, I minimized it. You know what I mean? I'm not mm-hmm. a macho guy, but it's just sort of like, this is how it is. You know what I mean? It's how it is until it isn't, you know? And man, I remember two stories. One was walking to play with a bunch of my friends at this club in Brooklyn on St. Vitus. I didn't know that, or I realized I had gout, but I had to walk Mm -hmm. to the club with an amp with gout in my right or left. It was so painful. Mm. You know what I mean? Right. And, 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 but like, but it's, you kind of have to normalize it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's just like, if you're blind, then, you know, you have to adapt. I have a friend actually who has gone blind in the last couple of years. And, you know, his transition has been amazing because he's an extremely positive person, great, great musician. But but um, the other one was that I would start, like, retching. You know what I mean? And I thought that I used to be anxious about going to work or something. I think it was the heart failure, looking mm-hmm. back. Because we went to the Central Park Zoo, I think. Um, we were, you know, my daughter was about three two or three, you know, it's a bit of a walk to Central Park from here. And you know, it was hot and, you know, blah, 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 blah. And we're going back and we're going, and I'm retching all of a sudden, I'm literally puking my guts out in front of Spike Lee's place. He's right down the next block. <laughs> it's like, oh my God, I don't want to be puking in front of Spike Lee's place, you know? <laughs> like, but, um, yeah, like, but that's, and then I don't know if you feel this too, then the guilt of like having this condition not as much for my wife, although I love my wife, but for my daughter, like to have to grow up with a dad and, you know. But. Yeah, so that was my main motivation for actually going through with the surgery. And That's a good um, one. at the time, though, so I already knew my wife had, she passed from um, stage four pancreatic cancer. I'm so sorry. And I knew that, you know, I had to do something major so my kids, you know, would have a parent. She yeah. was alive during this time, but I, you know, yeah. pancreatic cancer is only one outcome when it, when that happens. So it was a major decision that it was a no brainer, you know, because of the kids. Now, if it went for the kids, it may it may have went another way, but they've mainly been my main motivation. So, you know, I thank God for my kids every day. Did I invite you? Maybe there's the heart transplant support group on. Um... Facebook? Did we talk about that yet? I'm in a couple of LVAD um, support groups on Facebook. There's a specific one for transplant and LVAD. Mm-hmm. And that group, I have to thank all those people. If anybody's watching or listening, maybe I'll post this video. They, they were so loving and what's so beautiful about it. And I think the, you and I experienced this as musicians in the international community on Clubhouse that people can have different politics than me or whatever. But like when it comes to life, man, like I'm there for somebody. I, I don't care who they voted for. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Or or if they're, you know, I try to help out bigots, but um, 
as a practice, but you know, but it's a funny thing, right? Like there's certain people I'm talking to there and it's just like, but they showed me love. Like they want to know what I needed, mm. you know what I mean? And that's, you know, um, without getting into religion, I mean, it, it, it is the Christian concept of this, you know what I mean? It's works. I mean, you know, you can say whatever you want, but if you, you know, that's, and I think that that's what's so, been so empowering and why when I saw in your, in your profile, I was like, oh my God, there's no bad. Like, you know, it's an opportunity for service. Yes. This yeah. is, you know, and, um, and I think that, and, and of course, there's nothing like a near death experience <laughs> or many. You know, right. to sort of bring, bring a sobriety, right? You know, and like my, I remember my daughter right when I went to the hospital for a transplant, being like, "Dad, you're hugging me too hard." And I'm like, "I'm crying." There are tears. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I might not have come out of that. Right. Right. It puts things into in perspective real fast. It sure does. You know, and also I don't know if you found this, but because with the elevator, I don't have any experience with that. And transplant, we will talk. You know all the way through and past, but like I came home, I mean, with staples mm -hmm. in my chest and because of COVID, they took them out later. Like skin was beginning to grow. I mean, <laughs> some of this is gruesome stuff. I just want to say for everybody out there, like it ain't pretty, mm -hmm. you know, it ain't pretty. And people are also going to have different philosophies. Different teams have different philosophies. There's some people who are eating food that they were told not to eat. Mm -hmm. And the politics in between caregivers, whether or not it's a partner or whatever, like, you know, I remember holding a pan literally like this with my hand shaking my words. Do you help? I'm like, no, you know? <laughs> so it's, it's sort of, it's knowing what to do. And it's also, for me, also with the apnea, it makes it crazy because it's like, when am I tired? My wife keeps saying, Mondays, you're always tired. I'm like, yeah, okay, yeah, it's easy to say that, but, like, to experience it is really hard. I mean, with two kids, I can't even imagine, like, I, you know. Of course, I'm there for my daughter, but then there are times where you're just exhausted. Yeah. In a way that other people don't understand. I remember people used to say to me, before I was a dad, you know, when younger people, you know, but younger people say they're tired, like, they have no idea what they're talking about. Well, then you add that plus a transplant plus whatever else, it's just like, yeah, you know, and it's learning to prioritize, like, you know, for me, like, you know, I, I was the cat who was up until two in the morning and slept until 10, you know what I mean? I did whatever I wanted. So the idea of like my, of having to go to sleep, have a bedtime, you know, <laughs> it's good though. This practice is good. And that's the other thing with compliance. I mean, I'm not perfect. And my wife is definitely on me about, you know, she's like, yeah, watch out for sodium. I don't know if you need to eat that, but, you know, and it's it's a work in progress. Yeah. You know, I was really scared. I really loved rare steak before, which if you looked at the literature, you know, not if you were asking, somebody was asking recently. It's like, well, what can you have? And for me, like the one thing I would never do, because they're like, oh, yeah, you can have deli meat except a microwave. And I'm like, no. Yeah, that's still I'd rather so have no deli. No, I'm not doing that. <laughs> But the thing that I found is that I can have steak that is more cooked than what I used to have, and I like it. Mm -hmm. Especially if I cook it, I've learned to cook a lot better. To cook, <laughs> like, I mean, imagine the skills. Oh yeah. Oh, we also, I mean, we're lucky enough to be able to do this, but we bought a house in Connecticut, so in between New York and Connecticut. You know, and there's part of me going like, oh my god, like you know, say to my wife, like this is a lot to take on, and then a tornado. It two weeks after we bought the house, a whole bunch of trees came down. Luckily, the house was like, you know, like there's a lot to take care of with the house, yeah, you know. And now, with the kid who's going to camp on a bus for an hour each way, like in a couple of weeks, like and then COVID, right? So, mm -hmm. I have these just to say because it does have to do with heart transplant and being a musician, I have three gigs coming up, so. I have to talk to my team, but I have not taken the subway since February 2019, 2020. Okay. Or a bus. Mm -hmm. So I've taken Ubers, but there's no guarantee you're not going to get, I mean, and then the, did we talk about this already about the percentage of uh, heart transplant patients who've had both vaccines, which I have mm -hmm. uh, since March 29th. That's the second vaccine. No real side effects for me except a sore arm. 
for a little bit. I got I got sick on my second one. You got really sick. Well, so, no, what, so I, I I had the Moderna. The first shot was I've heard cool. that's intense. Yeah, the yeah. first shot was cool. My second arm was Moderna sore. Was hard. The yeah. second one though. It was the day after because I thought I was through it and I was cool. It was the Second day after. Day, yeah. yeah, that's what I've heard. I was watching a movie when the it was the day um, the new coming America came out. So yeah. you know I had been waiting I've, for that movie for like a whole year. I was like I'm going to watch the movie and I got the home right. theater set up and we had popcorn and everything. And as soon as I sat down to watch the movie, I was like, "Ooh, it's hot in here. I don't feel good." <laughs> and you know. Uh, it just I got I got the the flu like symptoms. I got a temperature. I was real achy, like all my joints was achy. And um yeah, I and made the it through, Elvet. And the Elvet. And the Elvet. And then I made it through the movie because I wasn't gonna miss the movie, uh priorities. <laughs> so I went and laid down and went to sleep. And when I woke up in the morning, it was like it never happened. I've heard that. My theory is that maybe your antibodies were stronger. Mm-hmm. Because you, because you haven't had the transplant yet, no. but I don't know. Mm. <clears throat> yeah. So, so this is something. So, to complain for a second, like so, to taking Ubers and you know cabs or whatever. But and who knows how safe that is, right? You know, there's the theories, you know, but um, mask up the whole deal. But uh, I've done two rehearsals. My friends were not wearing masks. Mm-hmm. They're all vaxxed, except for the drummer, uh, who doesn't believe in that. Uh, and then, you know, but it's inside. It's not outside. Mm-hmm. So who knows? And then, so I'm playing these two games. You know, we have, we're doing a rehearsal, same place tonight, with other people. And so it's exponentially this person you're exposed to. Mm-hmm. Who knows, right? And then, so there's, you know, there's fear that, like, you know, how do you function with all this stuff? But, oh, yeah. And then, so here's another thing, like, so I've heard people say it like casually, and I probably was like casual, but like at first it's really scary. It's like, wait, but I have to take my drugs, mm-hmm. you know, because you take them after transplant twice a day, mm-hmm. you know. For me, it's nine and nine. And so that meant that in the, in the middle of the rehearsal, I had to be like, excuse me, it'll be two seconds. I have to take my drugs right now, mm-hmm. you know, which is like, you want to talk about humbling, you know, <laughs> to have eight people going like, you know, and, um, but and you, you know, do what you do. being that we're amino compromised, I don't know if that's the right word, mm-hmm. you know, that's something we have to be. We have to think about. Like I was talking uh, earlier, I was talking to you. I was, I was in the hospital getting my INR done, and oh yeah, I was yeah. talking to the lady, and she was like, you know, they're getting ready to stop requiring masks here at the hospital, and I had to, to give her a double a double take, like at the hospital of all places, you know, that's where I want to wear my mask the most. But I don't know, yeah. man. Like I'm, I'm. I think I'm going to be wearing a mask for a while, especially around s- certain crowds and certain people. And you know, I, I it's just going. If it pisses you off, you're just going to have to deal with it because I'm trying to live. Well, maybe, maybe it's worth us having this conversation because we've talked a lot about. I mean, I think it needs to be said about race and class and all this other stuff, right? Like, there's, there are people of all races and all that stuff who believe that the whole COVID thing is a conspiracy and then mm-hmm. there's the whole <sighs> Tuskegee experiments and all this other stuff and you, and you have people like who are really believe me I mean I, there are a lot of people I know some are, are educated and they're still anti-mask and anti this and so I, I think the thing is is, is like learning how to navigate all you know mm-hmm. it's hard it's really hard and like i don't but it's and it's and then also being able to acknowledge all of those beliefs right but it's like you gotta i want to live and i don't want to give it to i mean not only do i have the transplant and i'm 56 but my mother-in-law got a kidney from my wife mm-hmm. so she's also immunocompromised right right so so at the same time it's like with certain people it's just like okay you're not gonna get the vaccine but then can you be inside with us or even if you're outside right because you know because i don't know if you remember during COVID, the first thing is people wiping off their amazon boxes mm-hmm. you know like, well where is it i was talking to my daughter the other day it's like well daddy you can't have runny eggs right 
which to me is sad. A little, I love radia. I love making her, you know, those uh, the eggs with the crispy whites with a lot of butter and then the runny yolks and you put them on a muffin, or, right? I can't eat that. Mm-hmm. Why? Well, but the thing is this, like they had to make it black and white for, for a lot of us. I think what the reality seems to be, I'm not speaking as a doctor, just to be very clear, is that your chances of getting an infection are much higher. Yes. So it's not like you're dead, <laughs> you know? Hey, hey. But if you're gonna, you know, I mean, my dad, bless his soul, was really against me eating mushroom pizza when I was a kid because you get botulism from the canned mushrooms. Mm-hmm. Did I ever? No, thankfully, you know? So anyway, yeah, about the masking. And then, oh, yeah. And so so then, then we're going to rehearse in the place I used to rehearse at, which is a much closer room and my friends like great they had the big room the big room is a normal room Mm -hmm. to me for the amount of people that are going to be in there right because think about i don't know about you but like because the cdc man i mean it's a bit of a cartoon right because they keep changing the guidelines and they're not clear and people don't know and the the kids can be three feet and six feet and then little kids don't they can't wear a mask but they can but they could get covid but maybe not you know, right. so so at Steve's place, this guy Steve, it's just like, oh, the great thing, the big room. I'm thinking like, I, was it even a consideration we we're going to be in the small room with like twelve people, mm-hmm. where there's literally not enough space well, to be. I'm on the media team of my church, and you know, I'm helping them put together live streaming. And that is a major consideration because, you know, we want to open up for live services again, in-person services again, but we know that there's going to be a certain population in the congregation that's just not going to be comfortable with coming out anymore. So now that, you know, that's a whole nother problem. And when you're dealing with something like a church, that's a lot of money that, you know, now we got to look into lights. Now we got to look into cameras. We got to upgrade the internet connection. We have to have the proper equipment on Mm. top of just paying the mortgage for the church and the electric Mm -hmm. bill. And so it's a whole Mm. nother issue, but you got to be considerate. It's a good, I would say a third of my church might be in their Mm seventies. So that's, that's a concern there. And what does that look like? Like, how do you go back to, I I keep telling people, we don't think about going back to normal. We have to think about the new normal. I mean, I think it's still based in the, we'll go back to church. We're talking about church anyway. And the concept of like, well, what is love? You know, I mean, I think that if you're serving community, I think for people to be disconnected is not good, right? Because there's some people who are sort of, they're going to, do their spiritual work online, but they're really disconnected, and that's not good for their mm-hmm. soul. But at the same time, isn't it serving a larger community to be able to have this as an option? And isn't it truly like the loving and tolerant thing to do that? You know what I mean? Like for me, in my spiritual practice, I don't necessarily need to be in a congregation of people. I feel it all over, and yet I still need to do works. And so what does that look like? Does it mean sitting next to somebody who might have COVID in a a building? You know, that's not so smart, right? Because if I'm damaging others or myself, that's not love either. Right. You know? So I don't know. It's a certain level of responsibility I think we need to have. And like you're saying, it's not about politics or any of that. No. It's about you may be perfectly healthy, but you got to think about the less fortunate. You know, you might have been blessed with great health, but there are people who haven't. So, as a you know, where have we lost just being good humans? Where what happened to that? Let's talk about that for a second. There's something I was talking to my wife about the other day, and you're an educated guy, um, and I consider myself one. Like I. I can't even understand how people of not very high education can go through the transplant process because there's so much to process. Yes. You don't necessarily need to be that book smart, but it's just the, the idea, like, I'm not saying this from Yan High, like, 
it's just like there's a lot to deal with. I am one of the best. I'm one of the best teams in the country, and still, it is just like I have to be on top of stuff. You know what I mean? And then I'm going to say this, and this is not so pleasant, but it's like the drugs sometimes tell me I heard something, and maybe that's not what they said.、Mm -hmm. So that's why the caretaker is so important too. People would say, "Nope, they didn't say that."、Mm -hmm. Why are you angry at them? Well, they said this thing. No, they didn't say that. You know, or you know,、uh, I don't know. It's there, there are a lot of considerations, and and yeah, and like and then and we're not there yet. I, I hear that in Israel that they began to make artificial hearts. You know,、mm -hmm. somebody asked me if I had a pig heart put into me. <laughs> Just like there's some story. This one guy used to be a power lifter. I forgot his name. Like Joe Rogan interviewed him. It's fascinating story. This guy、I、can't remember his name, but he was only a year and something out, and he was like, he looked so good. I was just like. Um, but you know, anyway, I think that the but the level of education, like taking and actually taking care of people, it's hard, man. Like, and there's so much. I remember even my nurse practitioner, because I said, you know, I have to take because you know, if I'm coming up for a 15 minute appointment, couldn't I do that on video, please? You know, like to go all the way uptown. That's half a day for me、mm -hmm. to go uptown, and it's eighty dollars. You know. And my time and and all this other stuff and um she, and I said yeah I take her she goes you don't take the subway I'm like this is during COVID she's saying this right I'm like what are you talking about but that being said I want to dovetail on this this has to do with people who are not even heart transplant people but like the economic. Uh, inequality in this country. There are a lot of people during COVID, especially healthcare workers that I dealt with. Some, some of the, some of these are the greatest people, and they have to work. Right, they don't have a some, choice. Right, some of them are choosing, but there are people who have to work. And I wonder what the numbers are. I don't know that anyone's going to be brave enough to look at those numbers. How many people got sick because they had to work? And they were careful, but other people were not. Right, right. And then Or, you got to think、uh, about yeah. like the 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 poor little cashier that works at the grocery store that's, that's barely getting、saying. minimum wage, and they're、right. deemed essential. You know, so、right. what? It, then you got to make a choice: do I feed my family or do I take this risk? Right, and there is no choice. And then, and then, when we were getting into other areas, man, love about how the. Trial protective services deals with that, but like, yeah, I mean, and it, yeah. So,、um, oh, let me just talk about. I'm going to switch gears for a second, but it's kind of related. Steroids.、Mm -hmm. um, I spoke to a, a woman,、uh, Tamika is her name, and、uh, her husband just got transplanted last Monday. Yeah, and I'm so glad that he did. They have five kids,、mm -hmm. and.、Um, I was saying to her, like, I just want to warn you, like, the steroids are kind of rough in the beginning, because I was on like twenty five milligrams a day.、Mm -hmm. That's a lot. I'm on like two, yeah, you know. So that's twelve times. And、um, the emotions, you know, it was it was like I could feel anger coming up. I couldn't restrain it. You know what I mean? Kind of like a three year old, <laughs> a、yeah. little bit. And、yeah. and、uh, I mean, besides, I mean, look, because there is a psychological effect with the steroids. Psychological, but also physical, and then like because you, yeah, and it's a long journey. You've had the L bad for a while, and so so I just want to say like if there are couples who were single people, but it happens in couples because like my wife, you know, there were a lot of situations where maybe I normally would have been a little bit care more careful of my words. I wasn't, and so I think it's important for caregivers to talk to each other too.、Mm -hmm. You know, because Tamika was telling me she's like, I've just been like so worried, and I mentioned to my wife, and I said, you know, like, is it okay if if you guys? She's like, absolutely, and you know, and she's like, you know, it's the most worrisome thing, you know, to think that the person you're taking care of could die in any moment.、Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I was look. I mean, I'll just say this, and maybe it's not true for everybody. It sounds like her husband, whose name I cannot remember right now.、Um, She says he's already walking, and it's just like it took me a while to walk because, like, I couldn't like. It felt like there's a, a it felt like I had like a weight 
over my neck and I was, I, it was hard to sit up like this because this was all cut open. You can't yeah. really see on the mm -hmm. camera. You can see like there's a little bump here. Mm -hmm. I have a hernia from all that stuff. And um, I was afraid to walk by myself because I was going to fall down. Like, what if I fall down, mm -hmm. you know? And so, um, yeah, it's weird. Like, cause I had services at the same time. Like this one person was like, you're fine. You know, and it's like, but it's scary because I felt almost like a vertigo at times. Mm -hmm. Makes any sense? I don't, I don't know if you felt this, like your blood pressure and everything. With, I don't know if what yeah, status. Yeah, standing like. up too fast. and You're just like, woo! Yeah, yeah. I feel in the shower sometimes still. It's like I have to just go slow. And Yeah, when I first came home, like I had to, my wife was just like, you really need this? I was like, yes, I need to buy a chair for the shower. Mm -hmm. I have one. Yeah. No shame. I got one. <laughs> so. You know, and then uh, the hospital, I could shave. Like, that was hard for me. So, yeah, uh, and it's little yeah. things because, like, I'm on the, the warfarin. And, you know, I got yeah. to tell my, yeah, my barber, you know, you got to be careful because if you cut me, it, this may be a bloodbath in here. So, you know, it's little things like that. I had a, um, a friend pass away um, because he, he got a little vertical in the bathroom, fell and hit his head. But because of the blood thinners and all the medicine, you know, he never came out of that. The blood pooled in his head and it was over with. So, like, you know, we got to be careful. It's little everyday things that, right. you know, we're sensitive about that other people sometimes don't get. No, but that's the thing. It's, it's sort of like, I mean, I, I've had it with many people, even like the mom of one of the kids I used to teach was epileptic. And she was very, very concerned about him having seizures and the, of us all being trained. We were not trained, you know? Mm -hmm. And like, I wouldn't train if I were paid to do, you know what I mean? It was like my job and it wasn't, a, a, you know, but I, and, and at the same time, I totally understand that this mom was freaking out, right? And, you know, and I was that parent too, where people were like, oh, you know, you just bring your kid, she'll fall asleep in the other room. I'm like, what are you talking about? Yeah. You know? So, yeah, I get it. And there's sometimes even my wife, she'll be like, oh, I thought you were feeling better. It's just like, yeah, it doesn't go like that sometimes. Mm -hmm. You know? You're better until you're not. Yeah. yeah, and one of the or, things or I, I kind of, yeah. I've, I've, I'm, I'm happy and I'm proud about, but one of the things I kind of feel bad about is my daughter. She is my second mother at times, you know, um, and you know I just want her to be a kid, but she's the for one she's the mass police. Like if we go somewhere and there's too many people, daddy, we gotta go. They don't got their mask on. We gotta go. You can't be around this. And, you know, it, it, it really broke my heart one night. She came in mm -hmm. and told me, you know, I need you to be healthy because you all I got. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, we got to take, you know, those kind of things into consideration. And, you know, I'm not being rude when I decline your invitation. And, like, things are coming back. And on my other podcast, I interview a lot of entertainers and local artists. So I'm always getting invited to different events and things. And some of them, you know, I got to respectfully decline because I just can't be in that environment. I got to look out for my health. What I find is I think there's always, you know, it's sort of like, it's like talents or fame or whatever. There's always room for more. In other words, like we're going to do what we're going to do anyway. You know what I mean? Coming from more of a, 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 a not a poverty mentality, mental poverty. You know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. like I, I can do what I'm going to do. Like I loved COVID because go to rehearsals, people not showing up late. You know what I mean? Right. Like, so I can, I can just like, I just studied comp. I told you I studied comp. I've been studying composition for a year with a guy, PhD guy in New Chicago. Found him through virtue, where virtue lessons, whatever it is. Very good, Justin Weiss. Uh, and uh, been practicing a lot of bass. I've been doing a lot of recording projects and you know producing and like it's amazing. Like, I'm so happy, mm -hmm. you know, and I don't have to go, you know, I don't have to be stuck in traffic going somewhere. Or, you know, said my, my uh, friend of mine, uh, Chris Terry, the bass player, because we we're talking about how do you get more gigs or whatever. He goes, well, man, you have to hang. And I was like, I hate that. He goes, me too. You know, because right. there's that thing, right? And especially, I mean, now, so now not only would, be, would I be hanging, but I'd be hanging without alcohol. 
Mm-hmm. <laughs> Which honestly, I mean, I, I still got to get my my head around all this stuff, you know, because I, I, you know, it's like learning to be uh, loving and tolerant of all, and you know, it's just not all about me. But at the same time, it's like some of that stuff is just boring. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like, what's important, right? Like, you know, being there for my my kid, and yeah, I mean, like, like I'm just finally, you know, with my wife, so I'm playing. Um, have a rehearsal the day before the gig and then doing the gig. I mean, first, my first time playing Lincoln Center uh, be J- July 6th with Mighty Sparrow. And um, that's going to be jam-packed, Yeah, I think. Yeah. You know, and uh, when, when we played out in Queens a couple of years ago, I mean, they gave us an RV to hang at the band. So that's like close, you know. And right. so that's all weird. But, but. But I'm talking about specifically is also negotiating with my wife. Now she has a very high power job and she used to travel internationally. And so then there's negotiation, it's a different situation than you, but it's also just, you know, because I, so she's like, so you'd be staying in New York that, and then you'd come up. She's like, I, I guess I'll be okay. I'm thinking like, I was taking care of my daughter for a week when you're in China a couple of years ago, <laughs> you know? So it's, so I think it's like, it's also, yeah, it's a new normal. And then also like what, what is right for me because my wife, her name is Wendy. She was, you know, she's like really worried. She's, you know, I'm not worried about you. I'm worried about all the people who just maybe didn't take care of themselves who don't know they have COVID mm-hmm. in a club yeah. or at Lincoln Center or who are very excited to talk to the bass player of a concert of a couple of thousand people they just saw or whatever, you know? Yeah. So I'm going to get ready to wrap up, but yeah, man. I don't want to glaze over who you are yeah. as a musician. So oh. I want you to speak about that for a few minutes. I want you to tell the audience, like, who have you played with and some of the people you've toured with, because I, I want to, you know, get, like they say, give you your flowers, because that is, a, you. you have a very awesome musical pedigree. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you, Sean. So. So first of all, if you want to see my credits, I still need to update it, but it's TomShad.com, T-O-M-S-H-A-D.com. The main credits I've had, uh, the biggest credit I played on the show, Blue Man Group, for 23 years in New York. Um, uh, I played with a band, a big indie band from Boston back in the 80s called Dump Truck. I'm on the record for the country. Played with this one band called Cowboy and Spin Girl um, that has released the record a whole bunch of different times. We recorded with Mitch Easter down in North Carolina in 85. Uh, I'm a freelance bass player and producer and composer. Uh, when, oh, tours. So I toured a bunch with Dump Truck in the US. We did a little bit in Canada. Did a bunch of like sort of coastal things with uh, Cowboy and Spin Girl, who are also known as Rift Doctors. And I've done like sort of like one off things. I'm not really, I think I was very happy to be in New York, you know what I mean? Like just with like a steady gig. I've done like a lot of just sort of hits around um, the current projects I play with this band, the Gershwin Brothers, um, uh, Mighty Sparrow. Uh, I have my own project, Dark Ages, which is sort of slowly trickling out the second album i'm already writing some of the third record um have my own solo stuff uh, you know if you just look up my name on youtube or bandcamp or soundcloud or you know i, mean, I just get into things as you know we just go and uh you know i was just on my first hip-hop track uh on common nasa city in school this past year on the remix and the, the different tracks, actually, on the remix and the main track. And, you know, I'm, I'm always looking to do more, you know? Like, this is what I love. My wife always said to me, she goes, you're not playing enough music, you're not happy, you know? Mm-hmm. So that's the thing. But, of course, negotiating that with a family life is sometimes can be challenging, right? Right. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm literally, I think we're going to our first, I think I'm seeing my first gig in person, my friend Amy, uh, the band Louder Daddy in Reading, Connecticut, this Friday. That's the first gig I've seen since January 2020. Mm-hmm. So there we are, 15, 16 months later. Right. Yeah. So that's that's it. Thank you for the flowers. I mean, you know, and and also, I mean, I love to teach. I I uh, I teach on Zoom. Uh, I have, right now, I have 
one guitar student, a couple of production students, and I'm always looking to do more. You know, I'm always happy to, to have dialogue, you know? Yeah, man. I really, Sharing. I really appreciate you taking your time out today. It's my pleasure. And I can't wait. I'm about to start traveling in a few months. And uh, I'm going to promise my daughter that the one thing she wants to see, she said, I want to go to New York. So I want the Tom Shad experience when I come to I'll New York. I'll show you around. Yeah. I'll show, yeah. I mean, we'll, we'll see when it's still <laughs> happening. <laughs> What's but available? I, 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 yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, it'll give you things you can't get down in Virginia. But, um, you know, it's, it, yeah, it's it, it's a funny thing. But, yeah, no, I'll show you the New York that's existing at that time that I know about, right? And or, then, or Connecticut. Or maybe you guys will come up to Connecticut. Are you driving up here? Yeah, yes, definitely. Well, then maybe you'll come to Connecticut. Yeah. You know, I mean, I, I don't think either of us have turned down good barbecue, right? No. And that's what I was going to say. You come down to Virginia, I got barbecue and seafood for you. I know, man. I mean, well, you guys, yeah, we got to talk about barbecue offline. Actually, some of the, I had some great barbecue long time ago we were driving down to north carolina we stopped in virginia with some nice stuff but seafood i could never turn away but i'll tell you man this this place i, I told you about in richfield connecticut which would be the last place i think would have great barbecue but that's my favorite that and the kansas city stuff yeah you know? yeah that's my stuff all right uh yeah for any look anybody if uh if you're thinking about getting a transplant or if you just got one or whatever, if you want to talk about stuff, feel free to hit me up. Um, probably the easiest way to do it would just be to uh, the email shadsongs, S-H-A-D-S-O-N-G-S at gmail.com, you know, and I'll, I'll get back to you because I, I do believe that uh, it's really confusing because you see a lot of doctors and they have like 15 minutes, you know, mm -hmm. and, and a lot of questions, as you know. Right. It's like, what is this rash? <laughs> you know, why? You know, you know, like, wait a minute. Like, why? Uh, we could just wrap up on this. It's like I, I joke with my with my daughter. It's like it's like for some reason, only my right foot gets really dry right now, like dinosaur <laughs> feet, you know, right. but just my right foot. That's the drugs. Very right? clearly, yeah. you know, so just to be like, yeah, 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 that's a thing or the memory thing. Yeah, you know, my friend, I'll, 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 I'll connect you guys uh, who just had it, you know, it's just like we talk about stuff. He's like, I don't know if I said this to you yesterday, you know, right. it's, it's crazy because I have like a, like a, I mean, you know, we, we talked, I mean, I remember a lot, but like my memory sucks compared to what it used to be. So, yeah. but the humility is good though, right? Yeah. And the appreciation right? of being here. This is it. There is only now. <laughs> Tom, I want to thank, thank you, you for it's been taking a pleasure, Sean. Yeah, yeah, man. Uh, you know, we're going to talk offline. But we're going to do that. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you for tuning in again to another episode of LVAD Talk. I am Sean. This is Tom. And we are out. We're out. <laughs>